Welcome to the CBIA BizCast. I'm your host, Allie Warshavsky. And today on our podcast, we have Jacqueline Gallo, who is Chief Operating Officer of Whitcraft. And she's here to talk about a unique program that allows inmates to work at their facility, which then prepares them for release and even a new career path. But welcome to the podcast, Jacqueline. Thanks for having me. Jacqueline, for anyone who doesn't know about Whitcraft, where are you located and what do you manufacture? So Whitcraft is located um, in nine different facilities across five states. Our headquarters is in Connecticut. Um, we do have three uh, larger facilities in the state of Connecticut in um, Eastford, South Windsor, and Plainville. Um, we manufacture aircraft engine parts. We have 1,300 employees and over a million square foot of factory space. And you said you're now you're in Georgia right now for, for work. So um, thank you for taking the time to join us. Um, let's talk about the headquarters in Connecticut. In 2018, you started bringing in inmates from the state prison to work a second shift at the facility. What inspired that idea? So um, twofold. One of the inspirations was that we did have a sister facility in Newburyport, Massachusetts, right outside of Boston, who had a successful partnership with a local prison and they were employing um, folks who were incarcerated and they were getting released during the day for work and then going back to the prison at night. Um, and I was a general manager of the Eastern facility at the time and we were growing. And so I was looking to hire um, anybody that I could that would um, could have the capabilities to be trained to work in manufacturing. Um, and then on the on a personal side, I have uh, some experience in with family members close to me who have experienced um, what happens after incarceration and, and really the struggle to find a meaningful career and a meaningful way to reenter society. Um, so at the time I reached out to, um, through the website to some of the local prisons and one person got back to me. Her name was Trina Sexton. She was the reintegration officer for the state of Connecticut at the time. And she came on site and we um, worked through the logistics to try to start a partnership with the prison in Enfield. And that was in 2018. How has it been going since then? It's been going great. We, we have now um, nine gentlemen who get bussed every day on second shift. It helps us to fill a need specifically on second shift. It's always more difficult to hire into that shift. Um, the gentlemen are more than happy to come every day. Um, they're learning a skill set. They're getting um, a fair wage and they also have full benefits. And then when they get released, we keep them on as employees and um, hope that they will continue to work with us. Now, um, you said they get paid a fair wage. I believe you said when we spoke before, it's minimum wage. And some of them can work at the facility for quite some time and save up a bunch of money, correct? Have you had longstanding employees who are incarcerated and, and continue to work? Um, so, yeah, I mean, basically the candidates who are eligible for a program like this, they get vetted pretty heavily through um, the state. So in, in order for them to even be eligible within the prison, they have to have um, meet certain criteria around behavior and that kind of thing. And they have to be within a year of release. So they can work with us for several months up to a year. And during that time, they can save all of their money. We do have several examples of gentlemen who upon their release were able to save money enough to buy a car and get out of any situation that they may have been in regarding their license. And then also we have other gentlemen who use the money to send um, money home to spouses and children so that they were able to get apartments or places to live. And fast forward on some of those gentlemen, their um, significant others were even able to go to school and um, try to provide opportunity or that's a more stable situation for their family. And you said that they also get vacation time. So when COVID hit, a lot of the employees that you have coming in for a second shift from the prison didn't even have to um, lose their wage, right? They just took their vacation time. 
Yeah, that's correct. Um, they have full benefits. We treat them just like any other employee. And the state, although the state is, I guess, able to keep their wages, the state does not do that. They allow them to keep their wages. So um, they have full benefits. And um, when they get released, that, that those benefits continue. And it is much more like a career um, than anything else. And they have opportunities as well to post internally and compete for jobs. So they can also compete for promotions and other um, jobs within the facility and even in other facilities. Um, so like I mentioned, we do have three facilities in Connecticut. We have examples of employees who have been released from incarceration, who have transferred from the Eastford facility to the Plainville facility because that was better for their family um, once they got released. So there's lots of flexibility to them. How has it grown or changed since you started it, or has it really remained the same? I know you had the bump of the pandemic in there, but have there been any significant changes or have you seen even more interest from uh, the incarcerated? So one of the biggest changes is that we have recently focused our efforts also in to sober living houses and halfway houses across the state. So those are people who are transitioning back into society post-incarceration and or they may be past living in a halfway house or sober living and be back at home. Um, we have been um, helping to uh, place those people into meaningful careers. And so I have now uh, well over 30 employees who are um, have some previous history of incarceration. Mm -hmm. And then in addition, we have the nine gentlemen who are coming from the prison every day. And then further development is that I'm currently working with the warden of the York facility, which is the women's prison. Her name is Trina Sexton. Actually, she's moved uh, to a different uh, leadership role within the state. And we are very close to having the first few female um, women who have who are currently incarcerated who will be released to do work and try to um, develop skills and therefore they could potentially have a meaningful career after they get released from prison as well. Do you have an employee that is an example of, of being incarcerated and then has moved up uh, pretty well through your company that you could share? Yeah, um, we have quite a few, but um, there are two that come to mind. One, um, Angel Torres, who has been in the news with me, um, a few different segments that have been focused on his life. He actually worked with us in the first group that we started this program in 2018. He then got released six months after working and continued to work with us in the Eastford facility. He found living in the area, even though he was from west of Hartford. And so um, while he was in a halfway house, he was working in our Eastford facility, gained a uh, many skills from us. And after about a year, he posted internally to our Plainville facility where he was awarded a role as a machinist, which was a new skill for him. And um, he worked again there for about a year on second shift and then posted for a first shift role, which he recently was awarded and moved on to a couple months ago. And he's just continuing to gain skills as a machinist. And also the first shift is just much better for his family situation as well. So he's been a huge success and it's been a wonderful, um, rewarding experience to watch him grow and, and see that benefit to his family. You know, you're, you're bringing in all of um, these incarcerated uh, men. Are there any characteristics they all seem to have um, that make them great workers that you've noticed? So I will say this, when we first started the program, we had a lot of employees who had a lot of trepidation about bringing prisoners on site. And the primary concern was that whether or not they would be safe, um, my employees. And I did a lot of round tables and left it with them, like, please, let's just check this out. I mean, there are a lot of things that we did to ensure that the people were safe by walking the facility, thinking through what dangers there might be and that kind of thing. So we did a lot of pre-work. Um, when the gentleman did come on site and after they were working with us for a little while, that completely changed. Um, the sentiment from the employees was, wow, 
this is like my brother. This is somebody who I really need to help and um, who is uh, genuine and really trying to change their life. And that just inspires people to have empathy and to try to help them. Um, they tend to um, be super grateful for the opportunity. I will say that. I don't want to um, group them all together because they are very different from each other and they're just like anybody else where, you know, um, they have personalities and thoughts and feelings about, about coming to work. But I will say that there's a higher chance of um, a sense of loyalty to the company for being given an opportunity. And I have seen that in the gentlemen who continued to stay with us. The other individual that comes to mind, um, and uh, he actually was released and worked in our Easter facility as well. And then um, he posted to South Windsor, which is our other facility, and he applied for a lead role. And he's now running a portion of the shop floor as a lead and is um, doing really well also. So for people who might think that this is just a labor shortage, um, per, like, issue um, that you are solving, it really seems like that's not true at all. This is really a career path building program that you've created. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the from a labor shortage standpoint, um, I believe that that will always be um, a, a condition or an issue for employers, right? I mean, we're always looking for pipelines for talent development. Um, I think this one has the added benefit of serving both the individuals that are underserved that are post incarceration and also benefiting the community because there is an impact that's positive, not just to the individual, but this is somebody's father, brother, um, or sister soon. Um, and uh, somebody's you know, aunt, uncle, and friend. So um, the more that we can provide that opportunity to these individuals, the more that we're benefiting the community um, and also the individuals. Yeah, you were saying when we spoke before, because sometimes if the father's incarcerated and can't provide for the family, it just kind of has this ripple effect of then the child might become incarcerated because they become um, with the wrong crowd. And this kind of stops it and lets maybe the parents who are incarcerated get control back of their life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I, I mentioned Angel as an example because I know he's been in the media and would mind me using him as an example. But these individuals commit a crime or they find themselves in circumstances where um, they end up incarcerated. The judge gives them a sentence. They serve their time. In order to be eligible for this opportunity, they serve their time well, meaning that their best behavior and they use the time to try to rehabilitate themselves, they get released. And then unfortunately, oftentimes they're, they're having to serve much more than the sentence that was issued to them because they're unable to reenter society in a meaningful way because employers won't give them an opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the second chance comes in. That's where as employers, we can give that opportunity, which helps provide a meaningful career path and a way to contribute to society that also um, benefits the children of those who were previously incarcerated. And um, Angel's a good example. He has three kids. Um, and not only is this job um, a career path for him, but it's a way for him to reclaim his family and to help stabilize his family and provide money so that they can continue to grow and thrive and not end in the same time, type of environment that he may have experienced. You know, you're, you're bringing in all of um, these incarcerated uh, men. Are there any characteristics they all seem to have um, that make them great workers that you've noticed? So I will say this, when we first started the program, we had a lot of employees who had a lot of trepidation about bringing prisoners on site. And the primary concern was that whether or not they would be safe, um, my employees. And I did a lot of round tables and left it with them, like, please let's just check this out. I mean, there are a lot of things that we did to ensure that the people were safe by walking the facility, thinking through what dangers there might be and that kind of thing. So we did a lot of pre-work. 
Um, when the gentleman did come on site and after they were working with us for a little while, that completely changed. Um, the sentiment from the employees was, wow, this is like my brother. This is somebody who I really need to help and um, who is uh, genuine and really trying to change their life. And that just inspires people to have empathy and to try to help them. Um, they tend to um, be super grateful for the opportunity. I will say that. I don't want to um, group them all together because they are very different from each other. And they're just like anybody else where, you know, um, they have personalities and thoughts and feelings about, about coming to work. But I will say that there's a higher chance of um, a sense of loyalty to the company for being given an opportunity. And I have seen that in the gentlemen who continued to stay with us. Where do you see this in the next, let's say, five years, this program? Do you see it growing? I see it growing for Whitcraft. We're continuing to grow for sure. Employers have reached out to me since I've been in lots of different media recently. There's a lot of interest in this. And I do think that employers are um, warming up to the idea of taking this, uh, this chance or this sort of calculated risk um, where it can be managed and um, it can be done in a, in a way that's safe, both for the um, employees who are working at the existing um, company, as well as the individuals who were given the opportunity to. Um, so yeah, I think it definitely can grow and it should grow. I mean, the population of um, folks who have been incarcerated or have some sort of criminal history, it's one in three people. Mm -hmm. And if you think about that those people um, are underserved right now. It's definitely a pipeline of talent where people can enter and really try to contribute to society and also to the business. So it seems like not only do you want the program to grow at Whitcraft, obviously working with your correctional, but just want other companies to follow your lead and, and take the chance on this program. I think um, I encourage anybody to take take the leap, try it with a few individuals. It's not any different than hiring anybody else really, as well as you vet them like you would anybody else. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, you may be a little bit more open or um, progressive when reviewing their history, you know, and um, like anybody, we interview them and, the, and we don't hire all of them, you know? So it's, it's not that all or nothing kind of thing. You can use discernment to try to make, um, make a decision that makes sense for you and for the individual. Now, I believe when we spoke uh, earlier, you said there's another, so you're obviously doing this and there might be one other company in Connecticut, you said doing it, or are there several? Um, there are, uh, there's one other company in Connecticut that's nearby our South Windsor facility that is actively participating okay. with a work release program with the Enfield um, State Correctional Facility. And that is also going well. And he's been a great spokesperson as well. That's that's Boatworks. Um, and so um, he also uh, promotes it often, the CEO of that company. And it's, it's working really well for him as well. Have there been any challenges that you've encountered that you might not have expected doing this program? Um, yeah, I think one thing that um, has come up, which we've had to work through, is just when people do get released, a lot of times they're not from the area that they're working in. And so it's hard for them um, to stabilize themselves in the area because they have to find housing and transportation and that kind of thing. Um, but we have recently been working with individuals to help um, help them find housing post incarceration and then you know it's been really warming to see some of our employees actually offer to pick them up or drop them mm -hmm. off every day from work just because the community really has rallied around these individuals to try to see them be successful and they you know they get to see them on a personal level too and i think it kind of breaks the stigma of you know of what people think um, about someone who might be incarcerated, which is just great. On another note, you know, we've been just covering so much and talking to other businesses about supply chain issues. Are you feeling the effects of that? Um, we are mostly in the labor um, market area of, of running the business. I mean, we are not, uh, we've been blessed that we don't 
really have a lot of um, issues with raw material shortages or stuff like that. Um, but we are just continuing to um, work through both the great resignation of like, you know, the attrition thing that's happening, um, as well as just onboarding and training people um, getting ready for the ramp. I mean, aircraft industry was obviously impacted significantly by COVID just like anybody else, but we are entering a time now people are traveling quite a bit and we're coming back into um, where we're in a growth period. Oh, that's great. Well, it seems yeah. like things are on the up for you guys and hopefully we'll be able to connect with you when you get uh, York involved and that goes well. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Well, thank you, Jacqueline, for joining us. And thank you for listening to the CBIA BizCast. You can listen to more episodes on Apple, SoundCloud, YouTube, and as well as at CBIA.com.